Good evening, and welcome to this new episode of Travels with a Curator. I am Xavier Salomon, the Peter J. Sharp Chief Curator at the Frick Collection in New York. And every week we visit, virtually online, a site that is connected in some way or another to the Frick Collection or a work of art at the museum. This evening, I would like to bring you to Westminster Abbey in London, one of the most famous sites in the city. And how is that connected to the Frick? We'll see in a few minutes. Westminster Abbey is arguably the most important church in the United Kingdom, one of the most important religious institutions in Europe and in the Western world. It is a royal foundation. It is a church that is directly and intimately connected to the royal family and the monarchy of the United Kingdom. It sits geographically in the center of the city of Westminster, the center of London, uh, next to the River Thames, close to the Houses of Parliament. And here you see this aerial view showing the entire church and its facade. In fact, even though the church was founded in the early Middle Ages, most of what you see today dates from the 13th century when uh, the Kings of England sponsored its building under the Benedictine rule. Uh, the church, the abbey, belonged at that point until the dissolution of monasteries uh, to the Benedictines. Here you see the side of the nave, you see the transepts, and of course, once you go inside, the soaring nave, this beautifully built um, Gothic nave in stone and perfect marble with the stained glass windows, most of this dates to the 13th century. But as with every great cathedral or church, uh, it took a long time to build it and it lasted centuries. So in fact, the abbey was not completed even though its core is mainly 13th century until much later. Um, in the early 16th century, the early 1500s, King Henry VII Tudor built the Lady Chapel, the so-called Chapel of Henry VII, uh, which is at the very uh, end of the church. And it's this wonderful combination of late Gothic style, British style, with Italian Renaissance. The tombs were actually designed and, and, and sculpted by an Italian sculptor called Pietro Torrigiano. So this great combination of late Gothic and Renaissance. But the church still was not finished until the 18th century. And so the facade, as we know it, the two bell towers are actually added in the 18th century by the great architect Nicholas Hawksmoor. So a long period of time, uh, almost um, 400 years to finish the church as we see it today. Now the Abbey, uh, as it is generally known in, in, in London, is connected to a number of royal events. And when we think about it today, I would imagine most people would immediately think of royal weddings. And of course, here I'm showing the most recent one. There's been at least 16 royal weddings um, that has, have taken place in the Abbey during its history. And it is a place for royal celebrations of different kinds. And um, of course, the most important event that takes place at the Abbey is the coronation of the kings and queens of England. Since 1066, since William the Conqueror, every king and queen of England has been crowned at the Abbey. And they've been crowned on this throne, which you see in this slide. Uh, just to give you an idea, of course, this is a painting showing the coronation of Queen Victoria. And most recently, the last coronation to take place at the Abbey was, of course, that of Queen Elizabeth II, uh, who you see here in this uh, iconic, beautiful photograph by Cecil Beaton with the Abbey, of course, in the background and wearing the coronation regalia. Now, the Abbey is not only a site of um, happy events, of weddings and coronations, but it's also a site of memory, burial and commemoration. Since the early days, since the burial of Edward the Confessor, uh, around whose tomb a shrine uh, was created, many of the early kings of England, uh, especially the Plantagenet ones, were buried around the shrine of Edward the Confessor. And all the way until the 17th century mainly, uh, most royal um, 
kings, queens, but also princes and princesses, uh, tended to be buried at the abbey. And just to focus on a couple of, uh, of tombs, you go from the Middle, Middle Ages ones, these really beautiful early brass tombs, effigies of many of the Plantagenet kings, to well-known royal figures like, of course, Queen Elizabeth I and her rival, Mary, Queen of Scots. Uh, only later on in the 18th century and uh, mostly in the 19th and 20th century have the royal burial site been moved to, uh, to Windsor and, um, and away from the Abbey. But the Abbey has about 3,000, if not more, tombs and memorials in it. And these are not only royal ones. Most of the great figures of English history, of British history, are either physically buried or commemorated at the Abbey in a way or another. Here, for example, is the memorial to Sir Isaac Newton. Charles Darwin is also commemorated at the Abbey and many other figures of uh, the scientific world. Musicians, and here to give you one example, this is the memorial, the very beautiful memorial by Rubiak of uh, Georg Friedrich Hendel. Um, there is, of course, the most um, famous um, area in the church, probably, is the so-called Poets' Corner. And this is part of the transept where uh, famous poets are, again, actually either buried or commemorated in a way or another all the way to the present day. And just to give you a sense of how packed these walls are, um, here is one of those walls with the plaques to Keats and Shelley, who of course are buried in, in Rome, uh, to Burns and at the center to Shakespeare, who is not physically buried here, he's at Stratford-upon-Avon, but is, is, is um, memorialized with this beautiful monument in, uh, in Poet's Corner. Now, all the great figures of the British establishment are commemorated in some way or another at the Abbey. And that is not just people in the scientific and artistic world, but of course also the military and political world. And probably one of the most important tombs in the Abbey is the tomb of the unknown warrior. After the First World War, after 1918, many European countries chose to bury an unidentified soldier from the trenches uh, of that nationality in a prominent place in the country. And that became a memorial for the First World War, subsequently, of course, for the Second World War and all wars in general. And if you think of these sites, they're usually very prominent ones in Italy, in Spain, in France. Uh, they're all in, in, in very public, famous places. But in England, they decided to bury the unknown soldier at the entrance of the abbey. So when you actually walk into the abbey, the first thing you find is the tomb of the unknown soldier. And here is the coffin before the burial. And here is the actual tomb, which I think it's an incredibly beautiful, moving uh, monument. This sort of black slab, very simple, always surrounded by poppy flowers. And I particularly love the second part of the inscription on this, which tells us that through this tomb, thus are commemorated the many multitudes who during the Great War of 1914, 1918, give the most that man can give, life itself, for God, for king and country, for loved ones, home and empire, for the sacred cause of justice and the freedom of the world. They buried him among the kings because he had done good towards God and towards his house. And this very moving poetic um, inscription really stands at the, at the entrance of the abbey to remind all of us uh, about uh, wars, about victims of wars, and about how um, millions of people died during the, the two wars for our own freedom. And, and what I like about the location of the tomb is that when you walk into the abbey, you have to walk around it. It's, it's in the way you cannot avoid it. So it's as if um, war and the memory of these wars has to be in front of our eyes at every time. Now, why is the abbey connected? to the Frick collection. And it's actually through military history. And it's not through the unknown warrior, uh, but it is actually through a very celebrated 18th century English general, General John Burgoyne, who was also known as General Swagger, or 
um, he was he was uh, also known as Gentleman Johnny. And um, we have at the Frick his greatest portrait by Sir Joshua Reynolds, uh, which was painted in 1766 for uh, a general, a German general, a colleague of Burgoyne, who wanted a portrait of Burgoyne and commissioned one um, from Reynolds. It was then acquired by G.P. Morgan and uh, the Frick Collection acquired it as a museum, the trustees did, in the middle of the Second World War in 1943 with a group of other works that were acquired, purchased from Jack Morgan, the son of G.P. Morgan after his death. So that's how the Reynolds came into the collection. But who was uh, Gentleman Johnny? Who was General John Burgoyne? And he is a very important figure for the history of Europe and for the history of America in a number of different ways. He was born in February 1722 in Bedfordshire. Uh, he came from the minor aristocracy. Uh, his family were baronets, but he was rumored to be the illegitimate son of um, an important aristocrat at the time. He studied at Westminster School, which of course is just next to the Abbey, so that was an area of London he knew intimately well when he was a, a kid, and he joined the army as a teenager. But around that time, he also fell in love with uh, a lady of the aristocracy, uh, Charlotte Stanley, who was the daughter of the Earl of Derby and the sister of one of Burgoyne's very good friends from school. Um, Burgoyne asked for her hand in marriage and the Earl of Derby refused uh, because Burgoyne was not important enough. And the couple rather romantically eloped. They got married secretly and they ran off to Europe to avoid the wrath of the Earl of Derby and the family. They spent some time in Italy, in France, and while in Rome, Burgoyne was portrayed for the first time, as far as we know, by Alan Ramsey, a painter he became very good friends with. And here he is looking very much the part of the dandy, um, set against the background of the Colosseum. This portrait is now in the National Portrait Gallery in London. Now, while in Rome, Burgoyne and his wife had a child, and they decided to return to England thinking that this creation of a family, the birth of a child, would in some way appease uh, the grandfather, the Earl of Derby. And so it was. And in fact, the Earl of Derby finally ended up accepting Burgoyne as part of the family and um, actually becoming fairly close to his son-in-law and, uh, and liking him in the end. So Burgoyne returns to London. And his life is really divided between military activities and civic ones. And with the military ones, he most importantly fights uh, during the Seven Years' War in Portugal, uh, between Portugal and Spain. And especially in 1762, he is fighting there and he wins the uh, most important battle at the time, the Battle of Valencia de Alcantara, which was a small town on the border between Spain and Portugal. Effectively, um, the British being allies of the Portuguese, they're defending Portugal against a potential Spanish invasion. And the fact that Portugal still exists as an independent state and was not absorbed by Spain is in part due to John Burgoyne and the British army who defended Portugal in 1762. He comes back from the Portuguese campaign as a hero. And he spends most of the 1760s and early 1770s in London. Uh, he becomes a member of parliament. And um, his civic uh, role at this time is very important, especially in his battle against the East India Company. He is one of the most vociferous critics of the East India Company, of colonialism, of what is happening in India, with effectively this company that is taking over the country um, on behalf, to some degree, of uh, the British government. And um, Burgoyne is one of the people who launches and, and, and has a very violent inquiry uh, in, in the um, looking at how Lord Clive, so-called Lord Clive of India, behaved while acting for the East India Company in India. And this ends up with Lord Clive's um, suicide. So Burgoyne is a very active member of parliament, but he's also very active in the social uh, world in London. He is a very good friend of the Duchess of Devonshire and, and, and very much lives in that orbit. 
Uh, he's friends with the architect Robert Adam. He's friends with David Garrick, the, the, the actor. And he's very good friends with Richard Brinsley Sheridan. And together with Sheridan, he writes a number of plays, the most famous of which is known, um, uh, is, it was called The Heiress. So um, Burgoyne is this great military hero, a literary figure, a very uh, important MP. And this is how Reynolds portrays him in 1766. Here is this great man uh, in his uniform. We know he was very elegant. He loved clothes. He was um, very fond of his appearance. Uh, he was a bit of a rake, a bit of a gambler, uh, a bit of a, of a man about town, and very much a dandy. Now, because of all these um, great successes, in the 1770s, he is sent by the British government with the army, with an army of about uh, 8,000 people, to the colonies in North America. Because, of course, this is the beginning of the American Revolution, and uh, he is sent there to fight the Patriots, together with a number uh, of other generals. And while in America, uh, fortune turns on Burgoyne. He is in charge of leading the British army uh, south from Montreal, from Canada, all the way down uh, to the Hudson, trying to stop the Patriots uh, from uh, moving and trying to keep them within New England and trying to stop the revolution. But of course, um, he loses a series of battles. And this ends up in 1777 with the Battle of Saratoga. And the Battle of Saratoga is really the key battle in the American Revolution where the British effectively are defeated. And this is the beginning of the end for the British in North America. So Burgoyne, here you see him um, surrendering at, at Saratoga to the American forces, um, becomes, uh, from the great victor of Portugal, the great man who is defeated uh, by the Americans. He returns to London, and of course, uh, much of uh, the last 20 years of his life are uh, um, shrouded in, um, in downfall and, and, and misery. Uh, he is, his commission is taken away. He is um, removed from all military um, uh, positions. And uh, Burgoyne lives a private life after his wife dies. He lives with his mistress, uh, with whom he has uh, a number of children but he lives in relative obscurity until his death in 1792. So what do you do with a man like this? As the great victor of Portugal, as the great MP, of course, he deserves a site in the Abbey. But as the man who effectively lost the colonies, who lost America to the United Kingdom, what do you do with this figure. And I find it interesting that you have this great general who was very lucky in the first part of his career and very unlucky in the second part. We now know, in fact, that the, the defeat at Saratoga was a much more complex um, issue than just his incompetence. There was a series of factors that, that, that helped the American of course, uh, win that battle and eventually the war. And Burgoyne was really at the center of this series of events. So the decision was that he was actually buried at the Abbey, but he was not given one of the great monuments that you see uh, celebrating all the great military figures and political figures of the age. He's buried in the cloister, in the North Cloister. And if you look at the floor of this cloister, you realize that it's covered in marble slabs that cover tombs of various people. And one of these is Burgoyne's tomb. And in fact, what happened is he was buried under an unmarked uh, grave, uh, an unmarked slab, and only later what was written on it was John Burgoyne, 1723-1792, uh, his dates of birth and death. And uh, it's a very simple slab, nothing else is there. What I like to think about when I see the portrait at the Frick is think that this is a man whose fortune um, was not as consistent as one always hopes in life, but a man who is at the Abbey for a number of reasons, uh, a great general, 
uh, but also someone who is commemorated in a very simple way. So I hope that when you go to the Abbey next and you visit all the great tombs and you think of all the great uh, heroes of English history, you will also have a minute to think about John Burgoyne and maybe visit his grave. Uh, he is commemorated not so much through a great monument at the Abbey, but through this masterpiece of painting through Joshua Reynolds's great portrait, which we're very lucky to have at the Frick Collection. Thank you for joining me this evening, and I look forward to seeing you all next week for another episode of Travels with a Curator. Thank you.